Ladies and gentlemen, Toronto is about to host an extraordinary celebration of LGBTQ culture, World Pride 2014. From June 20th to June 29th, the city will be transformed. Celebrants will flock to Toronto from all over the world to participate in a series of events, including parades, a human rights conference, street fests, concerts, art exhibits, films, and award presentations. Toronto is the first North American city selected to host worldwide. This makes me very proud. It speaks to our city's reputation for tolerance, compassion, and diversity. It also speaks to the vision, determination, and initiative of several people who worked hard to bring World Pride to Toronto, some of whom are with us today to discuss what World Pride 2014 will mean for our city. Our panel includes serving as moderator, Council Councillor Kristen Wong-Tam, City Councillor for Toronto Centre Rosedale. Kristen is my City Councillor and will be hearing from me later today about a little tree problem on my property. <laughs> uh, joining Kristen are Scott Mullen, Reverend Brent Hawks, Gavin Crawford and Kevin Beaulieu. I'll say a little bit about each of them. Uh, Scott Mullen is Vice President, Community Relations of TD Bank Group. In that capacity, he's responsible for TD's community giving and sponsorships and for its co corporate social responsibility agenda and programs in the US and Canada. He's also actively involved in TD's diversity agenda and has been honored with a particularly Empire Club compatible award for his efforts in support of diversity in Canada, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award. I love that, Scott. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, Reverend Brent Hawks is the senior pastor at the Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto, where, since 1977, he has been proving that you can be both gay and Christian. He's received numerous awards for his work in advancing human rights, including an Order of Canada. One particularly remarkable fact on his biography is that he offici officiated at the first legal marriage of a gay or lesbian couple. In the history of the world, he then mounted and won a legal fight to force the province to recognize the marriage. What an accomplishment. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> Gavin Crawford is a very funny man. He's an award-winning actor and <laughs> among Canada's most sought-after comedic and dramatic performers. Gavin appeared in eight seasons of This Hour Has 22 Minutes and has received acclaim for both his performances and his writing on that series. He's participated in numerous showcases and festivals, has worked with Toronto's The Second City and Sketch, and sketch Troupe, hey, uh, sorry, and Sketch Troupe? Um, <laughs> no, tri oh, and The Sketch Troupe, Pale by Comparison. Did I get that right? Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. And he's recently produced several one-man shows. Most recently, he co-created, co-wrote, and starred in Gavin Crawford's Wild West, a series pilot broadcast on CBC. Congratulations. Uh, last, but certainly not least, Kevin Beaulieu is the executive director of Pride Toronto and World Pride 2014. Under Kevin's leadership, Pride Toronto has made a huge difference in our city. Each year, it draws over one million attendees. In 2013, it had an economic impact of $287 million. That's dollars. And not to mention the inspiration and hope that it provides to its many participants. Each of our panelists has a unique perspective on today's topic. What will World Pride mean to Toronto? Please join me in welcoming them to the Empire Club of Canada. Thank you very much, Andrea. My, mic oh, my microphone is on. I'm, I'm going to try not to speak into my lapel, but raise the microphone instead. Um, I hope everyone's having a, a very good time, that you've enjoyed your, uh, your lunch. And uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, uh, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, we have a very exciting discussion ahead. And, uh, and of course, you're all here to listen and also to, I think, reflect on what does World Pride mean to the city of Toronto. And of course, it's a real honor for the city of Toronto to be the host city, the first time that this national, international, uh, global, uh, phenomenal event 
called World Pride is actually going to take place in a North American context. And the best person to start us off in this discussion, I think, is Kevin Beaulieu, um, who was uh, one of the driving force of, uh, of course, uh, of World Pride. And I know, Kevin, your work plate is super full. Um, but I'm just going to ask you to do a little bit of work and get us off of those, those, this discussion. And in your opinion, what is the importance of World Pride and the history of Pride Toronto and how we actually got to host this fantastic international event? Great. Well, thank you. Um, Pride Toronto began, uh, it, many people have different opinions of when it began. It, it really began uh, in the 19, early 1970s, and it was essentially a picnic on the Toronto Island with a few dozen people. Um, and then it grew, and uh, in, in 1981 was incorporated, and uh, <coughs> became, you know, grew uh, again, and uh, more people joined, and as the fight progressed, became a, a very important um, galvanizing event annually in our community, through good times and uh, through more difficult times, uh, whether we came together uh, to face the HIV AIDS crisis, whether we came together to celebrate uh, recognition of same-sex marriages. This happens every June in the streets of Toronto, and uh, the community has, um, has diversified, and the event has diversified to, uh, to, to incorporate and to acknowledge the contributions of, of uh, the many people over the generations who have built uh, such an important event, not only in our communities, but uh, increasingly over time for the city of Toronto itself. As you heard, um, last year, uh, the last couple of years, the event has drawn 1.2 million people uh, over the course of Pride Weekend into the city. Um, it's run by a, a small staff of uh, six to nine people. We have a few more this year for World Pride and a volunteer board of 12 directors and 2,000 volunteers we're going to be recruiting for the event this year. Um, it's really a very large undertaking and these people uh, commit themselves and, and work at it because they know the impact that Pride has had in our communities and in their lives and they want to contribute back. Um, let me ask, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to ask questions of the crowd, but who's been to Pride before in this room? Yeah, that's usually the case when I ask that question. It really is a part, a core part of uh, the, the summer in the city of Toronto, whether we're there to, to celebrate, sometimes we're there to celebrate defiantly when we've been told we shouldn't, but uh, it's, it's a real gathering and a, a special moment for, uh, for most of the people in this room, I guess. Now, World Pride is built on what is recognized as one of the world's uh, most successful and uh, largest Pride festivals. There have been three to date, one in Rome, one in Jerusalem, and one in London, and we know the next one will happen in Madrid in 2017. So it's still a fairly young institution as these things go. Every uh, community or many communities have a pride celebration. What World Pride does is creates the link, because uh, although we have those local celebrations, they're all part of one global movement um, seeking uh, LGBT human rights, and celebration of our uh, communities and, and our identities. So that's the idea behind World Pride. In Toronto, um, it means a larger celebration. It means that we've expanded beyond just the downtown uh, street closures that many of you will know so well and built the event on the strength of Toronto itself. Uh, the other institutions that have stepped up in partnership to program uh, during the course of the week uh, institutions like uh, TIFF and Inside Out, the AGO, Ryerson, the Ryerson Image Center, the list is very, very long. Uh, all of these institutions are helping us uh, to celebrate Toronto while we celebrate World Pride. So uh, really it is about uh, the LGBT, uh, T, LGBTQQ2SA communities <laughs> in Toronto, uh, but also Toronto itself. So I, that, that's a bit of background on Pride Toronto, a little bit of background on World Pride, and I'm interested to hear, of course, uh, what what other perspectives there are on the event? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's so much more than drinking. <laughs> <laughs> There's some of that too. I did not know that. <laughs> this is good. Actually, you know, there is more than drinking. And, and one thing. <laughs> Let's, let's talk I'll about join that you drinking. for drinking. <laughs> I, I should, uh, you know, there's so much, so much to say, but a, a key aspect of the event is, uh, is the recognition of the struggle for human rights. So uh, I should mention that very importantly, amidst the big entertainers, and we have more than uh, you know, we've ever had and a very high caliber, there is a human rights conference, the World Pride Human Rights Conference, which is central to uh, this event as well, where thinkers and activists from uh, 
countries all around the world, 150 of them will gather for a dialogue uh, about the advancement of uh, human rights in our communities around the world. Well, that's very exciting. Um, and certainly, I think there's been a lot of questions in the community and also abroad about, you know, so what's the difference between world pride and, and, and a regular pride? So I think we're, we're getting a good idea of what that is, uh, the difference is. Um, so most recently at the City of Toronto, we announced that we'd like to host a, a big grand pride wedding. Uh, we thought we could recruit up to 200 LGBTQ couples to get married. We wanted the city to open up Casa Loma as an as a elegant facility to allow couples who may be coming and traveling from places who are not permitted to marry. And so I'm actually thrilled to, uh, to be sitting here with, our, with uh, Reverend Hawks because uh, not only is he the first uh, person to ever officiate an LGBT wedding, um, I know that he did so wearing a bulletproof vest. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and today he's not wearing a bulletproof press because uh, times have changed considerably. But when we look at um, you know the movement of LGBTQ equality and two spirit equality, when we think about the symbolism of what that means when that rainbow banner flies, and then we think about the substance behind the partying, which of course is very important. A lot of drinking, a lot of dancing, a lot of partying. Um, how do we reconcile all of that in a global context where? There are many countries where if you are lesbian and gay, you're still largely persecuted, prosecuted, um, put into grave physical, psychological danger. And what can we do about that here in Toronto, Canada? Yeah, I think uh, that the, the Human Rights Conference is a crucial part of World Pride this year, and I think for a variety of reasons, one of which is there will be activists coming here from around the world. and I. I don't want to preach, but the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. And we've been very, very fortunate in Toronto and in this country. And we have an obligation to people around the world. There are 68 countries in the world where everybody in this room would be arrested for being at this kind of an event. Ten of those countries, those of us who are gay or lesbian, would be executed. And so we have a responsibility for those folks. And some of those folks are coming from very dangerous parts around the world for this conference. And this is a great opportunity for us to learn from them and also to share our perspective, the things that we've tried, worked, not worked, et cetera. And I think as, as Toronto, particularly the most international city in the world, according to the United Nations, as we play a role, an appropriate role, a helpful role internationally, this is a great chance for us to learn uh, and to build those kinds of relationships. So I'm very excited about the Human Rights Conference, and I'm really pleased uh, that Pride Toronto uh, has moved beyond the usual party, which I think is important, uh, absolutely important, because um, we need to celebrate our successes. Um, you know, some of us have some bruises from the past struggles, and uh, some of us have been around long enough. Uh, we've seen some of the changes over the years. Um, and so to be able to celebrate those changes is a great thing, but we also have to remember that the job is not done, particularly here in Canada, until we get uh, transgender rights passed by the Senate, um, then we still have big pieces of our work yet to do. But, but World Pride will be another chance to motivate us, to get us moving forward on some of these issues. And if there was one message that you would leave the audience in terms of an individual capacity, something that they can do individually, what would that be? Well, for some, I would say give money. <laughs> <laughs> for, nah, I, think, I think one of the reasons why we've made the advances that we've made in Canada has been places like, like TD, honestly. I mean, and not only just in Canada, but what TD is doing in the U.S., where it's not quite as easy to do what you do there is amazing and it's inspiring. Uh, but I think that the, the issue with World Pride is don't, don't be an observer. Don't just sit and watch World Pride happen. Get involved in one of the organizations doing some good work. Uh, if you're able to write a check to, to Pride Toronto to help with some of the extra expenses, do so. Um, but don't just, just observe. Uh, you don't miss this opportunity to engage. And to and be if you part. meet someone who's from a foreign country that may be more oppressed than Canada, make out with them. Hook up with them. <laughs> <laughs> it's world pride. Do your bit. Promote Hello, your city. <laughs> This is our and, opportunity. And, be, and because we are at the Empire Club, I will stress, write that check. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, speaking about check writing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good to see you again, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm often at his door going, hey, I've got a great project. <laughs> it involves art and community. Um, but, you know, I mean, Scott Mullen, his reputation in the corporate sector, um, I think for, for many of us in the LGBT community, um, I think it's actually quite extraordinary to sort of sort of see one person's head and face and name constantly float to the top, and I can only imagine the pressures that uh, this man faces uh, because he's so well known 
for reaching out and supporting our community in the way that he does on behalf of the TD Bank. And, uh, and so oftentimes, pride itself is sometimes criticized uh, for being overly corporatized. Perhaps there's just a bit too much of the, uh, the TD Green logo everywhere. But at the same time, we want the corporate participation. So here's a, here's a fellow who actually balances the two. How do you do it? Well, I think it's interesting um, to go back a bit for us. I mean, I find it incredible that we're having this discussion at the Empire, Empire Club, Club. Yeah. Um, which shows quite a bit of the progress that, that's happened. I mean, we started sponsoring Pride in Toronto 10 years ago, which doesn't sound, you know, for many of us, certainly for you and I, it doesn't sound like that long ago. Um, but you know, 10, year, <laughs> 10 years ago, um, our motivation actually in sponsoring Pride was, um, believe it or not, um, to send a message internally within the bank. Um, we were at the stage of trying to develop uh, a broad-based diversity agenda at TD, covering uh, lots of of groups and the LGBTQ community was part of that. And we were having a very difficult time trying to uh, create an employee network or to get employees engaged. So we decided that the way of sending a signal internally was to do something fairly bold externally. Mm. Um, so that's always been a very important part for us of, uh, of this, this agenda, is how do we demonstrate uh, to the community our strong support, but also how do we support our employee base and the 70,000 employees across North America, a very large company. So I think, you know, from a corporate perspective, there are multiple motivations. It's not just about having your logo at an event externally. It really is genuinely about demonstrating support for the community. Mm -hmm. Does that mean those logos are coming down? No, they'll be, they'll be discreet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I think some of us would advocate for more logos, uh, not less, that we would like to see more corporations mm -hmm. step up and follow that lead because, frankly, uh, it is corporate power, both financially, but also influence-wise. Uh, you know, the corporations are able to do more to influence government policy than some of our activist organizations that are very poorly funded are able to do. And so I think it's a great thing for more corporations to be involved, and I want to see green and other colors there uh, prominently. Um, and I also want to encourage those corporations as they donate money to also then, let's keep talking about the next step in terms of influencing, you know, I don't know how many countries around the world TD is, is in it now, but what you're doing in the U.S. is powerful. Uh, in what we could get other uh, agencies to do in other parts of the world could also advance the agenda. So, uh, yeah, you know, I was, I was just in uh, Philadelphia for the Equality Forum uh, to, to invite them to World Pride uh, late last week, and TD was recognized uh, there by the Equality uh, uh, Forum in a state where they're struggling with the same-sex uh, marriage recognition issue right now. And um, there, there was the person, just by coincidence, the person who handed over the award was from Toronto, and he just beamed with pride, uh, you know, to know that TD, a uh, corporation associated with uh, his hometown, uh, was being recognized for its work uh, abroad as well. So, it is very so, important so there you pride. have it. The official position from the from the gays of Toronto is uh, there's a big uh, bowl of logo soup. Jump right in. <laughs> and, uh, I know there are some uh, some corporate bigwigs here. Um, so we go from talking about the corporate uh, contributions to Pride, and let's talk about starving artists and uh, <laughs> and the uh, the arts and cultural sector that is so embedded into the the, the urban and cultural fabric of Pride. Because we can't really talk about Pride without looking at you know the the cultural contributions of LGBT artists. And, uh, and performers. So I think this is probably a perfect place for, for Gavin. You've, uh, you've watched this event uh, as an as a out gay man, and, uh, and what do you think? Uh, well, I think, I mean, in terms of World Pride, it's great in a way that just the expansion. I mean, I know, uh, you know, I'm usually doing Pride shows or things, but it's kind of usually kept sort of in and around the village and stuff, and it seems this year, uh, there's a lot of places that are really expanding. They're having Pride events. They're hiring like local artists to do things during World Pride. I'm like plugging myself. Sharon Matthews and I are doing a show, but we're doing it at Buddies, but we're also doing it at Second City because Second City, I'm a Second City guy, but they contacted me and said like, we're doing, uh, you know, we want to do Pride program. We want it to widen out, which is really, I think, important artistically for the city. And it's a chance, you know, for our artists to show what we can do to you know, people from all around the world, and then sort of international spotlight going on Toronto for a more positive reason than the He Who Shall Not Be Named show, you know, is, uh, is a good, 
<laughs> That's very good. Let's refocus our international reputation a little bit on something more positive. <laughs> Um, you keep, know. keep going, keep going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think in terms of that, and you know, Canada, I, it's a strange country for me artistically sometimes uh, because uh, a, lot, a lot of times we think we're done. Like, we oh, think, yeah. we, we get, there's a, uh, we think like, oh, it'd be, it's okay in Canada. It's a, we're, Canada's good, we're good. But I mean, you look at like our television and stuff, like there's not a huge gay representation on our screens at Canadian mm -hmm. screens. There's not lead characters that are gay in shows at Canadian shows. You know, like we're, where are they? They're not, America's actually ahead of us in terms of that level of representation. Um, so, you know, we have a little bit of work to do and it's wrong of us to think like it's done. Uh, and I like, especially with the Human Rights Conference and something like that, having that focus on that globally there's places that are very oppressive, it does also call into attention like A, how far we've come, but also how far we can kind of still go. Mm -hmm. So um, that helps. I don't know if that's really about the arts. No, no I, I think it is. It's also about representation. So when we talk about, when I, when I speak with, uh, with Canadian artists, oftentimes we talk about CanCon, do we have enough Canadian content here? So the question to not put uh, pride under too much of a micro, uh, micro, microscope, but here's, here's the question. Do we have enough Canadian artists performing at our Canadian uh, pr uh, culturally produced events? And with pride, put another lens over that, do we have enough LGBTQ artists, maybe some of the emerging artists, are they, are they represented at our festival? Because this is all publicly funded. So if there's an opportunity, do we not hire people from Canada, promote Canadian artists? Before Kevin, I mean, I think before Kevin we, defense, I think that yeah. you go well, ahead. Well, no, I mean, we do. There's a certain point. It's a very tough call because we, as Canadian populace, have learned not to get overjoyed by our Canadian artists. We just don't. Uh, you know, we're just more happy if Cindy Lauper comes. It's just the way of the world. Like, it's a bigger, it's a bigger behemoth. You know what I mean? Like, great, they, oh, Jan Arden's coming. That's good. Cindy Lauper's coming. I'm getting a ticket! <laughs> you know? That's just the way our media, like, we just do that. We're, we're right. a small population. And I think there are, you know, uh, I, I work at Buddy's Lot, and I, like what Brennan's doing a lot, but if you look at the Pride programming, that even just the World Pride programming that Buddy's done, there's a, they're really putting, they have some international artists coming in, but they, they really do focus on promoting the Canadian artists. And um, I don't know, I haven't looked at the entertainment schedule. I know there's some big announcements coming up. I hope one or two of those are Canadian, but maybe they're not. <laughs> can, 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 can we get a sneak view, for, yeah. a preview from Kevin Villier? Sure, so actually, I'm glad you, ha you asked the question because it's in the nature of headliners to get most of the attention in, uh, in a festival, and that certainly happens. So, um, you know, I, I see that uh, there are people joining us from OLG who have helped us to, um, to bring some uh, t Canadian talent to the festival. Our main headliner uh, for the closing ceremony is, in fact, Tegan and Sarah. Um, for the openings, uh, for actually in this room for the World Pride Gala, Katie Lang will be the, uh, the performer in, in this room. Um, but it's not necessarily well known that in addition to these headliners, and, and Melissa Etheridge is a visiting international artist for the opening ceremony, but, and you've talked about buddies. It is World Pride. We, we want a world lens on some of the talent, too, so we are co-producing with three of Toronto's theaters, including uh, Buddies and Obsidian and IFTI. Uh, a Ugandan playwright is coming to uh, do a staged reading of uh, a play, and um, we actually we put about 250 to 300 artists on our stages over the course of the weekend. And about 95% of them are local LGBT talent. They don't always get the headlines, but we're, we're very proud to host them on our stages, to pay them for their work, and to give them an opportunity to develop an audience. Um, I think it's one of the most important functions of, of what Pride does. I think another cool angle this year is the engagement of organizations and institutions like the AGO and the Ryerson Image Center power plant I know is planning to do something. You know, we've sort of typically seen Pride as kind of sort of in the, around the village, and as you said earlier, um, but to, and it, it was interesting to me, and of course people come looking for sponsorship, so that's why I know these things happened a while ago. <laughs> um, there was a fairly engaged uh, institutional audience in the, in the city wanting to participate in this event, so it wasn't a question of sort of begging them to do things. It was rather people really thinking that it was great for the city that this be a broader exercise and a broader event than just the sort of Church and Wellesley village. 
-hmm. And if you think of past prides, and, and not only just in the physical location where things have happened, but the organizations that have been engaged with us, this is a dramatic expansion mm -hmm. of, of both of those, both in terms of space, things will happen all over the city, uh, and in terms of organizations. So I think, what does World Pride mean for Toronto? It means we're building this movement in dramatic ways, and this is a big step forward uh, in terms of that increasing safe space and engaging lots of other organizations. So we're gonna benefit a lot from hosting World Pride, so I think it's exciting. So I know that uh, the city of Toronto uh, hands out some small community grants that are largely uh, in response to uh, applicants that come in and say, hey, you know, we'd like to organize something local in our community. They're very neighborhood specific. And uh, most recently, we, uh, our, our most recent grant allocations went to four uh, communities outside of the downtown core that were specifically pride theme. Uh, for World Pride, so certainly I can. Um, it, it resonates for, with us in terms of what we're seeing is that uh, uh, Mount Pleasant BIA was thinking about hosting a, a Pride theme type of mm -hmm. event, as well as Liberty Village. So it's really definitely expanding outside of the core. But for the, some of the neighborhoods where uh, they may not see the same type of critical mass and support, so you know you can walk down Church and Wellesley and everybody just <coughs> leave, leaves you be. Um, and, and in fact, you're actually not special because there's way too many of you. Um, but <laughs> if you go down to Scarborough and you're you know you if you're kicking up your heels, perhaps you, you do stand out a little bit. How do our community members who, um, who, who are living in areas that perhaps have not traditionally um, been as supportive and supporting, how do, we, how do we as a community respond to that? That's for anybody. This year's Pride Parade is seven days long. It yeah. starts in Etobicoke. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes all the way through, up to North York, around and down, and ends at the Scarborough subway stop. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm it's sure going to be road, amazing, but yeah. drink a lot of water. <laughs> getting the road closure permit will be no problem. <laughs> I think some of us, you know, because we've been around for a long time, think of, of you know, it has to be a major event or a major action, et cetera. But just think of how much courage has taken some people just to put a rainbow flag in their front yard during Pride. Mm. You know, and you see that more and more and more further afield, and they're coming out to their neighbors in some cases, right? And so, uh, in some cases, not knowing the reaction of some folks. And so it's just, it can be little things like that that are huge in terms of creating safe space, expanding. Um, the, the, the places where gays and lesbians feel safe. And uh, you know, so I think that you know, we're going to see rainbow flags in parts of the city that they've never seen before. And people are going to come out and talk to their neighbors. And I think it's, uh, those little things are amazing. Yeah. The Toronto Public Library, which of course uh, has room across the city, is, is programming for World Pride. And that's another way of getting into those neighborhoods. Um, you know, people of faith uh, across the city have networks that they may be, you know, they may be ge geographically distant, but they're close in other ways, and uh, I know that there's planning underway for what is apparently the first LGBT interfaith um, celebration and service uh, during World Pride. So that's another way of connecting in communities, um, sort of, I, I guess not geographically, but, but reaching out in other ways through other networks as well. Mm -hmm. This may be veering off another direction, but Go ahead. you know, take us. We've we've got some organizations in the city that are doing amazing work, and for them to have an opportunity to network with some places around the world, and I think for the the, the Center for Sexual Diversity, the U of T. I mean, training people to go out in all kinds of parts of the world to talk about sexual diversity, and and to be able to bring some folks here and to engage in those kinds of conversations. You know, the, the number of our you know our church, we webcast our services to 120 countries now. Um, and so to be able to talk to some of those countries about translating our service into Russian. I'm going to a conference in Estonia in a, in a few days, and, and they want to talk about that. And so you know, the chances of us to, to engage people from around the world and, uh, are amazing. Mm -hmm. So well, let's, let's talk about legacy for a minute, because I think that uh, when, whenever I hear about cities hosting big international events, we love to talk about legacy. So by the time the party is finished, the 10 days of celebration, you've got a hangover, then what? What would Toronto's legacy be after a, a million dollar production? Just about, right? Uh, we haven't built a aquatic center, and I don't see a velodome anywhere. Uh, what's, what's Toronto's legacy for World Pride? Why are we doing this? I can begin if you'd like. Part of the legacy is already being constructed, and that has been in the, the two years leading up to the event. when uh, with very strong support from uh, Tourism Toronto and the province, who also have an interest in extending the invitation around the world. The invitation has, ex has been extended, and what that is is a reputational 
legacy. People get to know that Toronto is a place uh, to go and to be that is associated with um, uh, something like World Pride and, and the human rights uh, component and the celebration. Uh, you know, we've put the word out into the world, and that's a lasting legacy. Um, building on, again, the work of, of many generations to achieve it, but um, that sends out a signal. It offers comfort and support and strength uh, to people and solidarity and uh, speaks to Toronto as, as a welcoming place. That's, I mean, it's not a velodrome. It's not a new highway, but it is a very important um, legacy. It's not even a new subway. It's not even a new subway. <laughs> You know, when we went out in early consultations with the community to ask, well, what do you want to see at World Pride? One of the first answers I got back was a new transit system. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'd, I'd look into it. <laughs> but I think also here's, there's... Here's an, the funding. There's, a, <laughs> <laughs> there's an internal, you know, there's a legacy in, this, in the city. There's the external reputation, but there's also a legacy, I think, that's left internally. You know, I think lots of companies, uh, certainly, uh, you know, our competitors are very, uh, you know, are very active in the diversity space. But there are still lots of employers where these issues, there are lots of, you know, lots of people in this city who go to work every day who are gay or lesbian and are not out at work um, because they don't feel comfortable. Um, lots of big companies have tried to address that, but I'm sure there are lots of medium-sized employers uh, who, who have not. So we still have a lot of work to do. While we have a great reputation, that reputation will be be cemented and, and, and expanded upon by, by World Pride, there's still a lot of work to do you know, in the city of Toronto, in southern Ontario, in Wawa, in places like that. So this is an event you know, that I think we, shouldn't, we should not uh, exaggerate how far we've come. We still have a long way to go. It's still a journey. And it's not just a journey about this file. It's a broader diversity uh, journey as well. So I think you know, we should be very proud. We have an opportunity to showcase this city to the world, but we also should recognize that this is a journey for many people, and that journey will be helped by what happens uh, at the end of June. I think two things in terms of legacy. Um, one is how, uh, how well we use World Pride to build the movement, and that will be the legacy, that an increased movement with more people involved, more people out, et cetera. And I, but I also think in, a, in, a, in numbers it's gonna be smaller, but I think internationally more, maybe even more important is what we learn at that human rights conference. You know, how many, how many countries now are going to be a part of the Human Rights I think it's 150, 100, and, well, it, it, it's not. A number of countries, I'm not sure. It's about 150, 170 people. It's yeah. 60 or 80. Including or the former Six. Prime Minister of Iceland, I understand. Former Prime Minister of Iceland. She, she and her Uganda, wife are both attending. Russia. So people from Uganda, Russia, et cetera, are coming. And what we learn at that conference about how we can appropriately be helpful, uh, I think will be a huge legacy issue uh, over the long haul. And number two? No, number one was the building the movement here, and number two was what we learned at the conference. Sorry, for I, I was paying attention. That's okay. <laughs> it comes with sermons. You have three points and four sub-points and eight <laughs> sub-points. And, and squeeze it all in. I, I was counting. I thought I missed one. You, you know, know, World Pride itself will okay. be a legacy, too, because it is, again, it's only the fourth one. And what we're hoping is that it will, this will be remembered as the World Pride where it really happened. It really came together. It really became that galvanizing moment that we were able to hand off. Uh, to the next city, so will our name long? Because the last one was not so successful in London. Arguably, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the brand itself is not as uh, is nearly not as popular or is not as commonly known as the Olympics. What happened in London, and what do we need to avoid so it doesn't happen in Toronto? Um, well, I was in London um, to, to see what happened there, and uh, in 2012. They had, in 2012, um, they had some trouble pulling it together. There was uh, not a great relationship. Uh, between the Pride organizers and uh, the City of London, in fact. Um, they didn't have a parade permit in the end. They weren't granted one, so they, uh, they had to exercise their constitutional, I guess it's not constitutional there, but their right to march uh, politically. Um, you know, they still had a great Pride, but it simply didn't come together sort of sandwiched between the Jubilee and the Olympics the way that the organizers had hoped uh, that it would. So it's up to us to really... Um, to rectify that and to set it on, on its right footing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I... When and I we have the support of our city, let me say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely the support yeah. of the city is there. We're even actually allowing uh, Pride Toronto to erect the stage um, right underneath the uh, Nathan Phillips Square fountains so they can blow off some fireworks um, uh, 
uh, and uh, and open flames, and that's the very first time that we're doing it there. So we're we good often, at openly flaming. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> lots of flames. <laughs> Sachet, chante. Safely for years. <laughs> So, so that's certainly uh, that's that's us supporting. That's the city supporting World Pride by letting you open the flames. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I when I think about the, the political support that's necessary, you know, sometimes we look at you know the city, of course, where you have a, a relationship as you're using the streets and all out the city assets, but the pro, the provincial support. I know that there's been some pretty good support there. And uh, did you have some federal support as well? The federal government has supported us for years, um, Canadian Heritage. Um, provides us with a grant uh, specifically for Canadian uh, talent at the festival, and that support remains in place. Um, the province has really stepped up in a big way, uh, I would say, in the past couple of years, again, helping with the promotions and the marketing to extend the invitation to communities around the world, but also um, in uh, helping to secure and, and pay the talent and, and the mm -hmm. production. The, our government partners have really stepped up at all three levels. That's great. So that, that, that means that setting the conditions for a, a successful pride, you've got all the right ingredients. Now you just have to control the weather. <laughs> if it rains. That's my job. That's yeah. your job. <laughs> I'm so I thought glad that was his job. Yeah. Yeah. Got <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit after the fact. But I'll they always do. And so far. <laughs> Good line, good line. So far, it looks like we should be lighting more candles somewhere. Right? <laughs> well, every time I look into a crystal ball, I see nothing but glass. And um, you know, right now, I actually, it's true, I just don't. Um, but I, I see my friend Phil Gillies, not to put you on the spot, Phil, but Phil is a, a progressive conservative candidate, um, member of the Rainbow family, who's uh, running in the uh, region of, of Brant, in the riding of Brant. And uh, so it's great to know that we've got that provincial support right now. So as we are sort of going through the election cycle, there's a city election, there's a provincial election, and a, and a federal election, all sorts of things can change. So I think that if we can demonstrate that, you know, Pride is not just a, you know, great, uh, it's just a great party, but it's also got, you know, a real uh, cultural integration um, uh, f fabric connection to the city, that it's not just held downtown, that you can demonstrate that it's been held across the city, that there's all sorts of political stripes supporting it. Um, we would love to see it continue to, to move forward. Um, you know, if there's a, if there's a, a parting word, if, if we were to sort of, um, sort of set the tone that way, um, what is your vision for our community in 10 years. We're, you know, I just mentioned I had a crystal ball, I saw nothing but glass, but these guys are special because they're the panelists and I get to ask the questions. So in 10 years, when we talk about LGBT quality and inclusion, where do you think we might be? If somebody's recording, we're gonna check your answer in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had some false starts in Toronto at trying to engage things internationally. We've done some things that we thought were gonna be helpful in the end that turned out were inappropriate and not helpful. And I'm hopeful that 10 years from now, that this city is playing a huge role internationally, appropriately so, engaging people on the ground in those areas um, so that we can, uh, can make a difference because you know, every, every week, you know, we gather together, we party, we you know, go to faith communities, we go to sporting events, we, um, and, and we have a freedom here that is, is the exception. And we have a responsibility. And so I hope that, you know, 10 years from now, you see us really engaged in what's going on around the world and, and doing so in, in really appropriate and helpful ways. And that World Pride is the launch for, for that shift. Can you give me an example of what that engagement would look like? I don't, don't leave us hanging in the abstract. Sure. Uh, I mean, a lot of us are really concerned about what's going on in Russia and what's going on in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And yet I guess probably most of us are doing nothing about it. So we have a concern, but we don't know how to focus that. And so we, ha we should be having conversations about when is a boycott appropriate or counterproductive? What can we do to fund organizations without it being seen to be North America funding you know, organizations and that being bounced back against us? What's the right way to help the situation in, in Uganda? They, you know, if you go out in the, in the satellite and look back at planet Earth, there are no national boundaries. Right? Mm -hmm. We are responsible for each other. So what can we do that's appropriate to help in Uganda? Some people are saying, well, we fund organizations who funnel the money through another organization to another organization that gets it on the ground in Uganda without it being able to backfire that it's coming from North America. You know, is there creative ways 
that we can do things? Do we need to bring folks from Uganda here to train them? Do we need to have radio-free Africa where we use radio stations to try to get into homes on the ground? What do we do to change the situation? Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't know the answer to that, and I'm looking forward to listening at the conference to try to figure it out. But my guess is, if you spun the globe around and you put your finger at any country in the world, then there will be GLBTQ people in this city from that country who want to help. Mm. Right? And so what can we do to help them? I, uh, to, to bring it back to a local perspective, I guess, um, you know, what I hope, I don't, know, I don't know where we'll be, where I, I hope we'll be, I, I guess, is a couple of things. First of all, um, our, the trans communities um, are really making some headway right now, and they're working very hard and, and achieving some results, and I hope that those are solidified, uh, especially in, in uh, federal law, um, but that, uh, you know, they continue to, to, to to, to move forward and have success in, in uh, those places, that um, the kids in school who are still being um, teased and, and beaten up aren't, and that they, they know where uh, they can find support and help. Um, I also, you know, as we gain acceptance in mainstream society here, uh, I hope we don't lose the cultural bonds that we've built. I think there's a great risk that we'll become comfortable and that events like this will be fewer and further between. And I, I hope pride will play uh, a continued role, a continuing role in bringing us together regularly because I, as far as I'm concerned, our social and our political strength has always been grounded in the social aspect of what we do and who we are. Um, you know, out of the bars and into the streets doesn't happen if you're not in the bars in, in the first place, right? So um, I, I hope we find a way, and maybe this is a good segue over to... Uh, <laughs> No, I think, I know you, uh, that's like, it's kind of my wish too. Well, <laughs> Ten years from now, I sort of wish that we all look as good as we do right now. Um, but also, um, I think, you know, pride in ten years, uh, for me, I would hope that, uh, you know, we're still having a, maybe less battles to fight, but I, I hope that we're still having a big celebration. But I, what I hope that is, is a celebration of uh, not only like uh, solidarity, but also a huge celebration of diversity. Like diversity, not only um, just with the community, but diversity within the community. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the, the married people, the non-monogamous people, like what, every kind of people <laughs> that we're all coming together. We're not fighting against each other. That like 10 years from now, we've, we've managed to like come to some kind of collective agreement that people are valuable regardless. And that's what we celebrate. The glass is half full, and I see that you keep filling it. <laughs> it's fantastic. So I think, uh, I think the internal uh, or the domestic agenda is as important as the international. I mm -hmm. think we, we sometimes, again, I just go back to that. You know, we still have debates about gay-straight alliances at schools. We still have you know, lots of bullying issues. Um, I would hope that we would be celebrating more the, the status of the success of, this, of the community and be less worried about the, you know, the fact we need to protest. I suspect we won't have gotten as far as that, um, and I hope we keep our eye on the ball on sort of things that are going on at home and abroad. And so with, uh, with respect to, did you, were you going to add something? No. <laughs> it would be your way, though, at the end. <laughs> So, so with respect to you know, the uh, our audience, you know, the Empire Club, and this is the, the second or third time I've been to the Empire Club. Every single time, it's uh, it, it's somehow a, associated to a head table. Um, but uh, but I, I think that uh, the fact that we're here at the Empire Club and the Empire Club is hosting us, that is a, is a reason to celebrate. So it's just another sort of incremental step to where we need to go. Thank you very much to the Empire Club. Thank you. And uh, you know, I want to I want to thank our, our panelists um, because you know I often see these uh, these fellas and uh, and oftentimes we're sort of you know at a cocktail party and uh, and I, I really felt this was a real um, a nice conversation just to sort of and, and really that's what we got to, to have is have a conversation and uh, sorry you didn't get to ask any questions I think there was a decision to you know just keep it here um, but. I have learned a tremendous amount uh, just from listening to them. 
uh, in terms of insights and vision, some of the battle scars, and I'm, I'm hearing you, you know, uh, Brent, that uh, there's a few. Um, and, uh, and certainly we are, you know, at a place in time at the city of Toronto, I, which I believe um, can only get better, because my goodness, it can't get worse. Um, but certainly, <laughs> um, but certainly I would think that, um, you know, when we are ready to, to welcome the world and roll out that rainbow carpet, and it literally is going to go around the city from North York, Scarborough, Etobicoke, and right along the, the waterfront, I would love our city uh, to be showcased the very best that we have. And, uh, and the very best that we have is really our neighborhoods and people when it comes down to it. And uh, I know that there are oftentimes discussions about, you know, when you come to Toronto, what are you going to see? Um, and, uh, and there are lots of things to see. But uh, I'm hearing um, in certain neighborhoods that I would not have normally heard from is that they're really excited about this summer and that World Pride is going to be a signature event. And, uh, and it's actually um, a historic moment for the city, not just because we're hosting World Pride, it's actually a historic moment for the city because the largest event we've ever hosted in the city of Toronto, the largest global event we've ever hosted, and my friend Mark Maloney is here, a former city councilor from Ottawa, um, and he was involved with this event and bringing this event to Toronto. But the largest event the city of Toronto has ever hosted is World Youth Day. And now, it will be World Pride. Mm. So for that reason, and of course it's a stepping stone to the Pan Am Games, but in many ways I actually feel that with up to two million visitors that are expected, and, and just so you know, the World Youth Day, I think we had about 350,000 people, and up to two million participants are expect, expected over the 10-day celebration of World Pride, um, that's a big quantum leap. So for, for those reasons alone, I feel so optimistic, and I'm seeing it now in our neighborhoods, and I certainly am, uh, am feeling it, and, uh, and, uh, and everything that you folks have been doing to lead the way, um, I'm just absolutely thrilled. I'm thrilled that you're able to join us today, and I'm thrilled that, the, that the, uh, uh, the Empire Club was able to host us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I was tempted to put on my TELUS necktie, but I thought that might be overdoing the corporate logos for today. <laughs> uh, please welcome MJ Perry to thank our guests. Um, human beings are strange. We like to say that we like to be just, but oftentimes we pick our justice issues by what interests us as individuals or what affects us as individuals, and we don't look beyond. One of the things that I have learned today, and I think many of us have it, from you wonderful people, is that in doing justice, even if it doesn't affect me directly, it's going to affect me some way. We benefit with humor, of, with learning from one another, with financial um, increase in our businesses. We, we benefit in so many ways by doing justice and being just. And I would like to thank you all um, for putting up with my nagging you for the last three months, for um, being here and for sharing that vision of what it is to be just. And I am very proud as a director of the Empire Club to bring a justice issue to the public square and hope we get to do it and have something this good again sometime. I'd like to extend a few final thanks before you all head on your way. Uh, thank you to the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives uh, for sponsoring our VIP reception today and to Mr. Discount for sponsoring our student table today. I'd also like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor and Van Valkenberg for providing our AV. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV. We're very grateful to them for their ongoing support. We're now on Twitter and Facebook, as well as online at www.empireclub.org. Come visit us. Thanks for all coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.